It is August the 5th, 2021, <laughs> and you are listening to The Future of Photography. Oh, the music's not playing. You know what? Everything's broken today. Okay, we'll do without the music. <laughs> Headphone, and... Headphones, music. It is. How bored. You well, it, it is the future of photography, and it's uh, a, a, a subset of it. Let's put it this way. Jeremiah is here, and I'm here, and Imar and Adrian are both not here because they're busy. They're doing re- something crazy with children, with their children. They're being responsible. And, and we're recording on a different day of the week. It's kind of a summer break <laughs> scenario. So It's it. It's summer in Europe, which means anything goes. We had a thunderstorm today, so... And yeah. that counts for we, summer. We in California did not. Really? <laughs> it's tinder dry. Very dry. Mm, okay. Well, well, well. So the question is, of course, what can the two of us talk about? Because, um, And I think we want to talk about photos and the story behind photos. We've done this already in a different context in, uh, in um, pickonephoto.com. But... Um, this time around, we'll talk about photos here, and it's all photos that have some sort of a story behind them, and of course, there are two different photographers, so there's probably different styles here as well, and uh, we've made a choice uh, of three photos each, so how about we start with one of yours? Which of the three do you want to start with? Uh, doesn't matter. You doesn't pick. matter. You're, you're the audience for my photo. That is fine. <clears throat> Here is a footprint in concrete, I guess. That's yeah. what we're looking at. So it's a yes. black and white photo. Yes, and gray and white. <laughs> or gray, gray and gray. Well, it's in... what? Okay, okay. First thing that I find interesting is that... Um, is the way you treat the values the brightness values in your photos in some of your black and white work, um, which I found really interesting. It's, it's the blacks are black, but then the whites are kind of squashed. You bring yeah. down your, your, your highlights to a level that I probably wouldn't bring it down that far, but what is the reason for, for doing that? Cause I find the look interesting. Yeah, it, it's basically um, kind of counterintuitive. You know, my, my I would describe my my overall uh, love of photography as it evolved over decades, really, as being one that's very attracted to high contrast images. Mm-hmm. I like snappy in color or black and white. I really like that kind of gritty contrast, grain, those kinds of of. Things that that are in a way narrow the 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 kind of overall tonal view with more extreme values and knock out the middle. Um, the pandemic uh, really gave me a lot of opportunity to kind of question everything. Um, you know, I, I tend to really like uh, very wide shots. Um, you know, at least uh, sixteen by nine. Um, and so I thought I would I would work in a square and really explore the very things that I really consciously would never have thought I really liked. And so I started to explore a very painterly um, gray. I wanted to really um, do a series of photos for two reasons, uh, primarily to explore the value of gray and how beautiful and soft gray mm-hmm. can be, especially with a little warmth. Um, when I print these, I print them on a, a bamboo Hanamule, and I'm using inks that are warmer than what you see. Not, not a lot warmer, but certainly warmer in the mids. The blacks are very cold. Whites, of course, we don't have to worry about. Um, and it gives a kind of velvety, um, emotional, kind of comforting feel. I, I really fell in love with that tonality. And, and then um, every day I would go out and walk during the pandemic and, and explore things that were uh, above me and below me um, and try and uh, really keep exploring the value of gray. Um, and th- this image... 
uh, which is a series of images about, you know, <laughs> one one giant step, uh, the, the kind of permanent... <laughs> it, it has a bit permanent, of this Apollo feeling, you know? <laughs> I mean, so there, there's the comedy part, which is one giant step. And then, then the other one is like, A, the, the kind of um, contrast emotionally between the isolation or the impermanence mm -hmm. of man in the environment, and yet the permanence of what he leaves behind. And not to get overly intellectual about the image, but because, you know, uh, as I walk, I just go, oh, I like that. And I composed it in a very specific way to, because I was exploring uh, kind of the, the, the kind of, uh, I guess, the geometrics of, of kind of broken concrete right. um, and signage. And all of a sudden I start to notice footprints, dog prints, all manner of, Isn't that of interesting? permanent. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Like, like if, if, if you put your mind to, on, on something, then all of a sudden you start seeing more of that. There's, a, there's some sort yeah, of like bias that, involved, right? But isn't that the beauty of photography? Oh, yes. Uh, isn't that the wonder of photography? That it, you may go out in a random way without anything in mind. In this case, I did have something in mind, which was, again, to work on the gray palette. And I thought, well, of course, concrete. Concrete being, helps. You know, <laughs> it does. <laughs> so, so my, you know, I'm I'm looking down a lot, but as I start to explore the geometrics, other things emerge, and for for several weeks, I mean, I have a very big collection of imprints in concrete, and taken together, uh, are there's an, a really interesting. Uh, I would even describe it as a sad poetic about what you, you you take away from the image. Who was this this person? Did they do it by accident? Uh, was it, you know, or, or was it on purpose? It's also a very interesting footprint because if you notice the the heel and the, you know, the, the whatever you call the front of the foot, they're slightly angled. Uh, and, and so it's, I almost feel that he stepped in, in the concrete with the heel and went, oh, and, but it was too late, it's and as like, yeah. he started to turn his body, he lifted out, and that made this kind of odd uh, imprint. And that's kind of my my story of of you know the man behind the imprint <laughs> in the concrete. I like um, this. The mind of a director. It's it's interesting because there's a geographical difference as well. Um, in Germany, a lot of the sidewalks and pavements are asphalt and not concrete so well here too here, here okay too. okay so so uh, but this I, was a sidewalk by the way this was a sidewalk. yeah but but from no, from no. most 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 of the sidewalks here are asphalt as well so oh. um we don't have i mean yeah footprints in concrete that's a trope but we don't have that many of them because our sidewalks most of our sidewalks are not concrete so oh. Oh. but the sure geographical difference there here if they did them in asphalt uh in the heat of summer <laughs> it be they would melt uh, yeah so it's not good anyway let um, me bring let me see uh, um no 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 oh yeah here <clears throat> here's a photo so tell us about this well it's moscow uh you yeah, see so. saint basil's uh church right in the in the right right from the middle mm -hmm. and uh which is Kind of the famous church group of uh, steeples with the with the colorful roofs uh, on the red square in Moscow. The onions. and 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 there's like a, one or two directions from which you usually see pictures taken of that. There's some iconic angles that are very typical, and then there's one angle with a telephoto through an archway and then you can have it in behind people's silhouettes and kinds of things. So I've explored all those. And uh, last time I was there and I've typically when, uh, when I went to Siberia to Lake Baikal, um, it was usually accompanied with a one or two day stopover in Moscow just to do some photography there and spend some time and explore the city. And uh, the, the one thing that I didn't know is that um, between the last time and the second last time, they built or they opened a park 
pretty nearby. And that park is very modern, futuristic. You see these these white balls that those are usually lit up and there's some art and there's some interesting buildings in there and there's this wooden deck that we're standing in front here and the weather was terrible. It was cold. It was miserable and um, but the park was there and a couple of people, we were three I think, uh, we just decided to explore that park and go uh, exploring and I ended up like I the park didn't really speak to me that much that was it, it felt very different from the Moscow I knew which yeah just 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 has a different mm, how do you say that a different personality yeah. and uh, this park just didn't work and the weather was crappy and it was cold and um, and it, it was it was snowing and rainy, snowy, rainy, slushy kind of uh, gray thing. And then uh, I I took a few pictures, and then this one, I I thought, how about trying to make this work with the twenty four millimeter that I have on the camera? And uh, so it's not a Saint Basil's photo per se. That's more of more of a decoration in the photo, uh, more of a an element to place the whole thing. It's like a vanishing um, line study. But these vanishing lines, exactly, that's the thing. I, I pretty much took the camera pretty low. That that wooden deck was, I don't know, knee, on knee height probably. So um, I, I took the camera low. I, I composed the slush snow in the front to be uh, in a nice place. Um, I, I looked at the geometry of things and the relation of different things in the photo. And uh, then I took a, a fairly overexposed shot. The original is by far not as nice. So that took a bit of was work. Was that on purpose? Was that on purpose? No, or? it was. It was me having the camera on manual and the weather having changed, more light being there, and I didn't notice. And then I took the photo, but I was so miserable that I decided to just go with it and not go back and take it again when I noticed. So. Um, luckily, the photo was there was enough information to tickle all this out, so it didn't have to do too much. Do you find uh, Do you find that some sometimes our our, our mistakes are technical mistakes? Oh, totally. <laughs> I know what's focus, I know where going. <laughs> exposure, composition, but not always, but sometimes lead to really provocative. Yes. Uh, images uh, which you have to really work through in uh, in post, in in, in editing, um, even in recomposition, um, and that that's you know that's the fun of it. I mean, if this was, for example, shot in I don't know, ca call it uh, Tri-X, for example. Yeah, and and which is and black and white film. Yeah. Yeah, um, with a moderate amount of grain, um, and and you you took the the steeples on you know in the kind of near the center, and you just blew them up full frame. So it was extraordinarily gritty, right, uh, in grain, and made it high contrast. You'd have another image. Yes, and you know what I mean. There are so many images within all of our images. Um, we must never really forget that, and that's why I think uh, when we talked last week about the power of editing, um, you can, you know, the, the challenge is for us as photographers is, is there a great photograph somewhere in here? Mm -hmm. It may be our original or it may be something that we discover, which is very much the same thing as when we go out for a walk without any specific goals. It, it just opens ourselves to exploration. Absolutely. And that connects us to being in the moment, um, you know, away from our political, social, health, fam all, all of those those things that play on us and create those inner voices. Um, this just roots us. And so I, I, I always find that any, any image, um, uh, and this would be an interesting challenge, really, is for us to, to even pull a stock photograph for the gang, you know, something that is <laughs> insipidly bland and, and 
each of us make something wonderful of it. I, I think that would be a fun thing to do, I do to this, further explore. I sometimes do this with photographers when, when we're out traveling or on workshops, where when I notice that someone is, has a hard time finding the shot, that, um, that we, we stop somewhere and I say, okay, do not take a photo. Just show me what are the pictures that you see right in front mm. of you and yeah, that's uh, great and and then yeah. uh, that's a very good exercise just just look and try to try to visualize those frames in front of you and change the size of them and the and the aspect ratio and uh, exactly. try, try to do visual uh, crops in your mind and uh, and then and then try taking those photos so do you also find that that a great lens to have with you if you're carrying more than one is a macro lens. Um, I usually can, can, don't. I, I have a couple of good macro lenses, but I usually don't bring them because often I'm. I, I like the wide landscapes, <laughs> and, and, and you see the twenty four is still my favorite focal length. But I do usually bring like a like a close up lens or something to put in front of a regular lens just to make it into or a even diopters. Macro. Or a diopter or Even something diopters. like that. Even yes. diopters. Because often if you're, you know, you're in a place that is uninspiring, at least overtly, thinking about your environment through the eyes yeah. of a macro lens really heightens the, the awareness of where you're at. Yep. Yeah, and and um, so, you know, in every environment, in every light condition, uh, I, I believe that there is great joy and, uh, you know, an artistic approach. And it doesn't have to be the greatest photograph in the world as long as it puts you in that moment to appreciate where you are at that moment. I think that's the joy of photography, really. Very, very true. Let's look at your second photo. Uh, okay, second so photo. This. <laughs> go ahead. Talk we're, about it. We're, we're still we're still gray. No, this is not even gray. This is more on the beige side. I would think <laughs> there's yeah. there's this no. This is the beige kind of gray. Right? It's, that's your beige phase. Okay, so th there's yeah. there's no white in there. Again, you're squashing the whites down. Um, not as far as in the other photo, but in a it, 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 pretty far. It's it's reminiscent of a, of a photo from Daguerre or someone like very Fox old Fox Talbot maybe Talbot kind of photography yeah very yeah. old oldish photography um, but of course it's not yeah uh, you know uh, anyone who's seen my my kind of pandemic posts on Instagram know that I you know I posted hundreds of of photographs of the canals uh, near my house and and uh, a, a beautiful place to walk, a very peaceful place to walk. Um, and it was, you know, my so my daily sojourn through there. And so I, I literally have photographed these canals uh, enough for a very dense book of them um, in every kind of light, in every kind of color, in 3D, I mean, you name it. I've explored these canals. And this one remains one of my favorites because it is, A, uh, when, and we talked about this, the weather, it was a foggy day, not uh, that um, unusual for what we call June gloom or May gray. It was about a year ago, May. Uh, and and if you're at the right time of day and can hit the fog in in this particular area, it is absolutely magic because of the way the light, the light really comes through is trying to come through over the trees on the right of the image, which you can see are a little bit more flared because the the, the sun <laughs> is buried in dense cloud and fog. So it, it just there's a beautiful sense of backlight. But I wanted to do a very reductive image. I wanted it to just be another very simple poetic, again, the same standard of, of velvety, um, unchallenged contrast, but very, very soft. I do love blacks in, in the work, and that's possibly because, again, uh, this printed looks very, very beautiful, uh, again, because of the density of gamma of, of my black inks, which are insanely black. <laughs> um, 
but I didn't want, like, I, I thought it wouldn't be served by a white sky or anything like that. So I did shoot this monochromatically, but I also wanted to bring the, the warmth in. And this, while it's warmer than the print would be, it starts to tilt to the mood that I was capturing. And again, there is a solitude, um, which is again in the... Um, I, I guess in the expression of of mood and the year and the uh, pandemic isolation that so many of us uh, experienced and uh, to a greater extent are experiencing even now. Um, and, and so a lot of these images that I consider my, uh, the pandemic um, world of, of the expression came out of, of expressing the isolation and also exploring monochrome in a different way that I was used to. Yeah, it, it, and, it's, and it's interesting because um, normally, I mean, this this is like, this has the contrasts squashed really hard. You have the, 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 the blacks are, are really black. And then normally that goes with a brighter, with brighter brights. That's what contrast is, but you brought those down. Um, warming them up is interesting too because I connect fog with the opposite, with coolness, with coldness. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it is a it is a it's an interesting. Um, there, there's two things going against the grain here for me slightly, uh, but then of course I mean the the two things for me that make this shot is the bird on the right bottom, um, yeah. with its reflection as a pretty yeah. much almost a silhouette, and that yeah. one lonely little palm tree right in the middle <laughs> that sticks out yes. behind the bridge and, and uh, yeah. comes back in the reflection. Those two, for some reason, um, probably the palm tree even more than the bird for me because all the lines lead to mm. it and it yeah. just sits there. And I have photographed that palm tree in bright yeah. <laughs> color pop reflection, you know, mirrored many, many times you, in different you, ways and it draws me as well. You, you said something about coming back to these same canals over and over again and photographing them in in all different kinds of lights and that's again an exercise that i often do with people um to or, or suggest to people uh to take pictures of the same thing in different on different days at different times of the day and different weather conditions different light conditions different seasons um i did this exercise once with I mean, it's a lazy kind of exercise because uh, a place I used to live, um, there was a church steeple uh, visible out the window. And so I I only saw this from one window, so I didn't really have any choice in how to compose it um, or, or in, in, in perspective. I could compose it in different ways, but the perspective was always exactly the same. And I decided to take the exact same photo um, probably a hundred times with all sorts of different... Um, with overcast and bright sunlight and evening and morning and uh, thunderstorm feeling with black clouds in the background and um, and uh, and uh, um, the sun low in the sky it's like weird light and fun light and good light and bad light and everything and this for me and this goes back I don't even know 15 years now and this ended up being a really valuable exercise um yeah to learn yeah, about would, light I, and what it does to things and it, uh, it, I, when you go ahead when you when you do the same kind of w when you're capturing the same arenas over and over and over what happens is you start to explore what what is unfamiliar about the familiar mm -hmm. and and also, but there's the, the counter approach in photography was to, is to make the familiar unfamiliar. In other words, the, the thing that you see every day photographed in a new way is just as interesting as the opposite. Yeah. And again, these are processes for photographers uh, that really um, deepen the appreciation of the form. Um, and anybody c can do it. Uh, it's really, it's not about the final image. It's about the process and it's about how we approach um, our own uh, kind of presence, our appreciation of being able to see and, and, and see 
clearly and see detail uh, or see in, in a macro way. But, but there's so much that we don't understand about our world. There, there's so many wavelengths that we, we cannot even see with our eyes and uh, radio waves that are coming through us and hitting hmm. us and bouncing. I mean, we are living in a very narrow spectrum and yet within that narrow spectrum there's an infinite amount of exploration and i think photography helps us with that i think sound designers are are very much in that mold as well because they yeah. go out with a microphone and they listen and they capture the sonic realities and and that's also very very beautiful and then you have the abstract you know uh, a movie like Koyana Squatsi, um, you know, a, a film that it, it's cinema, but it's also image making, music, mood. It, it, it's um, nonlinear. So it, it, it just is a big poetic about juxtapositions of, of the world. Um, these things, I think, give, give us great appreciation and are very important now in our very polarized universe. You know? Yep. You're right there. My second photo is a picture that I took in Siberia. It's yeah. a frozen river, and it's, it's a tree that sticks out of a frozen river. And in the background, you see the, the, the edge of the river. Um, and... Uh, this was one one of the photos that I ended up falling in love with, and it was just it was just a lucky pick on the on the edge of the road because um, I remember I was with uh, with one of our guides and uh, he drove and I I I have come okay so so there's photographers who will not shoot unless the camera is on a tripod unless everything <sighs> is perfect unless all the perfect filters are on and the uh, iso is set to exactly the right value yeah. um and i would I, I i will happily shoot out of a window of a moving car you know i would i would happily yeah, yeah, so would I. happily um try to bend and, and try to stretch the ability of the camera by whatever, reducing the shutter speed, cranking up the ISO just to get that shot. Um, and this is one of those, which, um, again, if I, if I go and zoom all the way in, then there is a bit of camera shake in this picture. But um, that doesn't really bother me because it was one of those moments where I noticed that tree and it was just there for, I don't even know, probably had a window of five seconds to take this photo and I was lucky enough it's really to... It's really great. I mean, it, it like I feel that odd, it's odd to say this, but th this just because I can see the motion blur in the background, so I know it's moving. Uh, I, I think you probably had a moment just to move your hand ever so slightly as you're shooting. I, I guess that I'm is not sure of the pretty much what speed. happened. And it, it was it, I was lucky the camera was switched on. Oh, no, I wasn't lucky because I have my camera on standby all the time. I don't turn it off when I'm out and about because I often have these uh, spur of the moment kind of things that uh, I, I know if I don't capture this, it will be gone. And yeah, that was one of those. Oh, and, yeah, then, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. and then in post, I, I just I, I like the I like the cold. I like the ice, and this ice is on this picture, as you see, it is bluer than it was in reality. There's no added color; it's just uh, enhanced a bit um, of what was there to bring out this um, this uh, juxtaposition of the of the cold ice and the warmer nature and earth tones. Pretty yeah, much. what what I like about this image is it really, <laughs> and again, I'll get intellectual about it because why not? Uh, you know, it represents the struggle to survive. <laughs> you can <laughs> definitely put that in there. <laughs> this tree is is probably going to be totally fine the moment the absolutely. It falls, you know, but yeah. but think of think of this. Uh, how powerful and strong nature is. Oh yes. Uh, that 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 something and and this tree looks extraordinarily healthy. You know what I mean. Yeah. And you know the 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 roots are are deep and and are asleep, 
So it just puts itself in a hibernating mode. Um, meanwhile, the river underneath the ice keeps flowing, I assume, uh, but the, you know, probably very, very thick. So the roots are very, very deep. Um, and, and it makes you really wonder how it would be to come back to this at the height of spring or summer. Well, you know, the, very, the thing is, this pretty. is near Lake Baikal and uh, Siberia in many people's minds is known for the cold and for the ice. That's what most people connect with uh, Siberia. What most people don't realize is that in summer, it's the opposite. We are talking summers with over 100 Fahrenheit. And oh, yeah. we're talking winters with minus 40 and colder. So uh, it, in summer, this, this whole place is full of mosquitoes and bears <laughs> and tourists. And in winter, um, not so much. Neither of the bears are asleep, the tourists are gone, and the mosquitoes are not there. So no. I like it in winter <laughs> much more, but it's supposed to be really nice in summer as well, at least in some areas. Yeah. No, I, uh, I, I feel it. I mean, yes, I live in California and have for, you know, half my life. But, uh, you know, a reminder, I did grow up in Montreal, ah. whose climate is extremely <laughs> similar to <laughs> Siberia in so many ways. Maybe, maybe like, uh, like uh, Beijing or Berlin, you know, but, it, but it's that biting cold in the winter where you have to breathe through a scarf and blistering hot in the summer. And of course, spring is 10,000 black flies, mosquitoes and what have you. There's three or four months of absolute grace. Well, the Russians have their banya culture, which is the uh, same as the, the saunas in Finland. So sure. if it's cold out, you end up just boiling yeah. yourself in the evening yeah. <laughs> with a glass of vodka. So you here go. is your third picture. Um, yeah, I, it's it's, it's from, from, a, from a gray values point of view, it's the same kind of thing. It's same uh, the same series, sort of, I guess. Yeah, uh, there's a kind of illusion here that's interesting, the kind of deep and or, or extended, you know, is it coming up or down? There's yeah. that. Um, okay, again, so in the so same, for those only listening, it's a footprint in the sand. Yeah, single footprint, my own. Um, but again, it, you know, same theme I thought I would bring to the, uh, the show, just that isolation, the pandemic, and yet... It's a footprint on a beach, so that's kind of, uh, you know, there's a different kind of isolated feel. Um, someone was here, you know, and yet, unlike the footprint in, in concrete, this one will be gone, you know, when the tide rises. So, um, but again, I, I, I had been looking down and exploring. At this moment, I had been taking pictures of the waves of sand, like small dunes. And I was actually photographing them uh, for a series of black and white lenticular prints um, that would just be about shifting sands very, very subtly. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's very hard to, to show <laughs> lenticular prints uh, on, on a website. Um, <laughs> it's very difficult. But, <laughs> but it, you know, even video doesn't really do it um, much good. But I, you know, I, I continue to kind of work experimentally in lenticular form too. But then I, I had stepped carefully to get a very clean image of these kind of small little ripples in the sand. And, but before I kind of moved off, I, again, I was looking down all the time and I thought, wow, that's a kind of a little perfect, near perfect image of a single footprint and and again that the feeling of isolation and and impermanence did you make um, the footprint so, for the picture or no no I, I i was stepping through and i saw it and i and i i carefully <laughs> lifted my foot out you know because i i was just walking and i saw oh there there is a enough undisturbed sand around it to make a nice square composition. And again, the exploration of gray, uh, which is counterintuitive to beach warmth and all the rest of it. So, uh, By the way, I, I'm, I'm one of those who can make the 
who can make the picture flip from convex to concave and back. Oh yeah, it, go uh, for it. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been doing it ten times in the last few minutes. I'm like, oh, <laughs> no, it looks nicer when the sun comes from the left. No, from the right. No, from the left. Mm -hmm. So that is fun. Um, yeah, undisturbed sand. That reminds me of Morocco trying to do this with big ripples in sand in the dunes in the Sahara. Oh yeah, and. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I, and I was looking for pictures that would look almost like computer generated, perfect. You know, no imperfections in the sand, and it was yeah. really uh, it was not that easy because there's always something that makes it break in one way or another. I'm wondering. Uh, I may just just for just for giggles. Uh, I'm going to put up um, on our something for you to, to react to since we're talking about sand and and the like. Um, here we go. Should be there. There it is. Yeah, um, it'll take a minute to come over here. Yeah. Okay. Um, but there's something interesting about... Here we go. Let me bring this on the screen. Yep, there it is. Three pebbles on... Well, it looks like perfect sand it does doesn't it is that some cloth is that sandpaper <laughs> what did you put it on what did i put what on <laughs> there, there is nothing real in this ah uh, you tricked me the, yes the, the the rocks themselves are photogrammetry the you know uh, this is a complete digital image yeah um Done Which this week. I, I guess with with uh, with these things, um, as long as there there are no people in there, it's easier to pull off. I guess sure it is. Yeah. <laughs> but, but but again, and I've been I've been playing. This is extremely recent work, like this yeah. week, and 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 still in ex exploratory form. Uh, but again, the simplicity and sand. It's meant to be sand. Yeah. Um, uh, but but in in digital, interestingly, if you want to make it real, you are tr you're gonna try to introduce some imperfections to fool which I, the which viewer, I can. which you definitely yeah. can. But you didn't in this case. And as a photographer, no. I was trying to find the most perfect undisturbed areas so that it would look like it was computer generated. So. <laughs> yeah, well, that's making the familiar unfamiliar, and the yeah. unfamiliar familiar is you know again the working in that kind of meshy gray zone. It's always fun. Yeah. Um, anyway, just thought I'd throw that up for fun. <laughs> so here is my third and last picture. Why did you? Oh, that's very why, similar. To why, did, why did? Why did I? Ah, here we go. I, I removed you from the shot, and I should. Okay. Um. Oh, nice, nice, nice. This is a very, a very Love different it. picture. <laughs> it's nothing to do with no, the others. No, but really, this is. Uh, this is a, this is a great picture. So you know, uh, it's great. So we're, we're looking. I, let me let me react to this before you say anything about it. Right, um, I've traveled a lot in Africa, and and this this so much captures the energy dynamic and and the just the the moments that occur, but the color, the personality, the the kind of immediacy, the flaws, all of that stuff really. Um, generate a, a tremendous feeling of Africa. That that that's how I feel about it. And um, and you have experienced it. So for you, it's more of a of a recognizing something that you already know, right? Mm, yeah. So we're looking at a at a portrait of a boy. Um, it's not a portrait; it's a snapshot. Um, and the boy is has a has a red necklace be yeah, beaded necklace. or beaded necklace with uh like they're all red apart from the one in the center which is bright yellow so that is the definite splash of color um we don't see his eyes so it's the nose the mouth and uh part of the parts of the chest which is in the out of focus area of the picture uh, the focus it's not it's not even focused <laughs> i mean it's 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 uh motion blurred a slightly camera shake uh, motion in there and the boy does one thing that I've seen a lot in especially that area of Ethiopia which is just slightly stick the tongue out and I never really got a good answer why 
uh, why many of them do that, but they do. And it's it's often as a reaction to, I mean, you, as a photographer, you want photos that depict how people really are. And uh, for that, you kind of have to get close to them. So there is a constant, um, it's, there's constant give and take from both sides. And uh, you give something by being there and, and, and uh, in some cases money, in that case no money, but um, you you might satisfy their curiosity about you. They come and, and tug your hair and touch your skin and they're probably not in that area, not used to tourists. So it's more of this, um, uh, I find you interesting and uh, and I'm happy to get a bit closer to get, uh, get some photos that are more interesting. But in that case, um, the, the, the closeness I almost feel like the sticking the tongue out is a bit of a of a reaction to I wouldn't say a threat but a, a reaction to someone getting close I'm again maybe a, it's about keeping the spirits away the dark spirits away. I don't think that's the case I mean <laughs> what we're looking at here is um, is not not some tribe deep in the jungle that doesn't that doesn't have any contact to civilization. No, those beads are plastic. It's um, there's somewhere back there is a pile of uh, Nestle water bottles, um, empty of course. There's like civilization left and right. So it's not a it's not a it's not a, the wilderness and and people who who are yeah. afraid of you or something. That's not the case at all. So, but but by picking out just those elements of the the face, the tongue, the necklace, I just yeah, yeah I think it, it's it a worked. great sense of place, even though it's this is in in some ways a minimalist photo. Yeah, you know what I mean in terms of subject and composition and and even focus. I think if this was totally crisp, sharp, and it in focus, work, it wouldn't no. have no, it wouldn't have the power. It, it has now which is this immediacy you know you really feel that you you were in the moment at that time you just took it instinctively there was a relationship that goes beyond the taking of the photograph it's just that moment again oh and and, of and he had a really good laugh when he saw the photo afterwards because oh, um that that's that seems to be now uh, the, kind of the normal reaction let me see the picture let me see the picture yes yeah so of course you share and, and then of course you share a few more pictures of your family of your surroundings so that they can sure. get an idea where you come from because you are in their in their home at this point so um yes. it's only Very fair nice. to to share back and yeah um it was a very a very good experience a very fun experience as well and that is one thing that is very typical. So that's why I chose this one. Oh, and yeah, th three and very different photographs in mine. They are three very the same. <laughs> which, which again, I, I think that's yeah, it's fun. I, I just went through my library. The reason I picked those three um, was not because they are so they would be similar in any way. No, uh, it was more of um, yeah. those were the last time that I th those were both in in 2020 before oh, yeah. the pandemic so those were the last two times that i spent time not where i'm right now <laughs> we, we 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 call those the before times the before times yes so they have a they have a, a very deep they, they they evoke very deep emotions for me because they are sure. um yeah. Because they they bring me back to a, a bit of an easier time, a bit of a more relaxed time. Yeah. My, mine were all taken in the mournful time in the in the in the darkness, in the darkest part of the pandemic, which hopefully it was the darkest part, and we're not heading towards that. But yeah, uh, good good question. Let's not speculate yeah. at this point. Um, no. It's time for so, the picks of the week. Let's look at um well let me bring up mine first and this is a very technical one but uh one that i'm 
I, I just came across. So, so here's uh, here's the setup for this. Um, being a podcaster, talking about photography, talking about the tech of photography, and some of the podcasts that I do, um, I often get questions from people. What alternatives are there to the Adobe universe? Because a lot of photographers who aren't professional, they they are just not ready to shell out a hundred bucks a month or twenty bucks a month for parts of that cloud uh, subscription service. Um, and uh, I always struggle giving a good answer because yes, I mean Photoshop. There is Affinity Photo that replaces it mostly for me. So. That's not a big problem, but the other the other pieces of the Adobe Cloud suite I'm not too familiar with. Maybe Illustrator, yes, but um, so I came across this little graphic here, which is uh, I found this on Reddit under a subreddit called Cool Guides, and this is a little guide to uh, alternatives to Photoshop, Illustrator, um, Lightroom, and so on. And it doesn't just give you the alternatives. It also sorts them nicely into what platforms they work on. Are they free? Are they open source? Are they free of charge? Are they single purchase? Um, so it really caters to um, to those who <laughs> kind of want want to escape the the fangs of Adobe. And uh, yeah, go and try a few out. They are definitely not always. Uh, a very good replacement, but uh, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of aspects of some of the tools that are fairly easy to replace with them with some of these tools. So, yeah, I mean, I've used a lot of them um, just because you know to explore. And there's usually um, I, I find I mean I'm a very long term Photoshop user, sure. you know, uh, from the beginning. But but I I do think that some of the alternatives. Usually, I, and I, I believe this is probably true at their inception, where there is one thing that they do much better. It may not be everything, but they, like they may do layering better. They may do luminance adjustments easier. Um, all of those things uh, are, are worth uh, exploring. And a lot of these, uh, you can test them out for several days right. uh, for free. Um, till you commit. Um, some of them are relatively inexpensive. I, I think before you plunge in and buy editing tools like a professional would, um, you really have to ask yourself, what am I looking to do in post? Is it just simply an adjustment of, you know, color, saturation, density, bright point. There's a lot that can you can do on your computer nowadays that's built in, um, just in terms of basics. Absolutely. Uh, if, if you just want to use those basics and explore layers, which is something that Photoshop is built on, well, you could probably find a single, very inexpensive piece of software just to layer your your pieces. And if you fall in love with layering and and and, then you may be leaning towards going to Adobe because you're now addicted to that kind of workflow. But if not, you know um, what's you know, you know what's interesting. My brother is a professional uh, graphic designer, and he used to work with the Adobe Suite. And he gave up mm -hmm. on it and uh, switched over to Serif's products, the Affinity line, Affinity Photo, yes. Affinity Designer, mm -hmm. Affinity um, Publisher, uh, which, All excellent. which 100% cover what he needs to do. Um, I have uh, the only Adobe product that I still regularly use is Lightroom because there is unfortunately no replacement for that. But um, the, the Affinity Designer is kind of my go-to now because it does more than just one thing, much, much better um, than what what Illustrator does, for example. So it really works for me. It took a bit of uh, a bit of retraining your muscle memory because the keyboard shortcuts are, are strong in you. So um, took a bit of that. But after that, a hey, I'm not gonna book. I'm not going back. Definitely not. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I I, I use Lightroom uh, to manage all my files. I I think Lightroom uh, is keeps getting better and better and better. Uh, I really have to say, as bloated as it is, they had a they had a bit of a phase room. where it where it was 
tough, but uh, they're yeah. coming back. They're but coming they've back. popped yes. through, and and yes. uh, I think the relationship with their cloud imaging and their uh, you know in computer imaging are getting closer. Um, I've been exploring Photoshop on the iPad, um, which is very very interesting. Though it it still ain't Photoshop, <laughs> you know, but yeah. the way I know it. But but all of these, be, yeah, I have a feeling that that as the years progress, companies like Apple, possibly um, others, will integrate more and more sophistication in image editing right into their operating system. Oh, and, and I can I can do a lot of things to photos just with uh, what what's on board. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, and, and uh, I do that with my phone. So, um, to round this episode off, you brought us some photography. Yeah, I just thought, uh, again, uh, this is uh, just for, for anybody um, interested in kind of nat natural, <laughs> call it natural light photography. Uh, but <laughs> It's neon light uh, photography. I just love this photographer's work. Um, but it's not just photography. There is some compositing going on there, right? Uh, I... I don't know if there's compositing as much as getting rid of stuff. Really, that's that's what I mean. There's there's uh, the, these buildings that uh, he photographs are are all very freestanding, and yeah. I don't. It, it there, there must I think be he some. He gets rid of everything. There they must be. Like there must be cleaning up there. Yes, <laughs> they look like models. They look fake. Uh, which is again, that's what I like about them. In other words, it's amazing stuff. I'm pretty sure th these are really these are real places. Yes. But he makes them look like a construct. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so that creates a little tension and a way of looking at them in a careful way. Of course, I'm sure he adjusts color um, a lot. They look uh, as if this, you. Yeah. Uh, they look as if you are looking into a snow globe of sorts. Yes, and I think I find these magic, absolutely magic. Yeah. Love, love this. Wow, how do you find work. these things? How do you do that? I, you know, it's r probably like you. It's it's just random, you know. All of a sudden, you know, I, I'll I'll look, I'll be checking an Instagram, I'll see something, I'll go to them, and they go like, oh, I like this person. I'll I'll just, yeah. you know, I'll just go a little bit down the rabbit hole, and it doesn't <laughs> take much descent to find uh, incredibly brilliant work. Very true. Here's the tower. Wow, it's this so is cool really, stuff. This is awesome it's stuff. It's so good, so good. And of course, um, of course, um, rain on, yeah, in the, um, at the rain at night with artificial lights around. Yeah, can't beat it. <laughs> this is hard to beat. Good stuff, all right. Um, Jeremiah, thank you for your time. We did it. And, um, we did it. We did an episode, just the two of us, and uh, we just slightly missed the other ones. So uh, we'll see what we can do during the summer. Um, but we're working hard to bring you episodes every week. And if not, then, hey. There's, Tough luck. There's a, <laughs> and we'll be back a week a later. There's <laughs> a ton of episodes to go back to. So there might be something in there if, you, if you're new to this. All right, that's it. Um, no outro music because the music is broken in this new setup. So just imagine the dulcet tones of uh, of George. And thank you all. We'll be back bye. soon. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>